This is Domenico with Easynomics, and we are going to continue with the Keynesian model, looking at a second scenario of uh, the creation and elimination of an inflationary gap. And we're going to continue our discussion of demand-side policies. We mentioned in the previous video that Keynesian macroeconomists um, believe that the aggregate supply curve does not shift. And so wherever aggregate demand is in equilibrium with the aggregate supply curve is where it will sit. So if AD shifted into a recessionary gap, it will just sit in the recessionary gap since the aggregate supply curve cannot move. And thus it requires government intervention. The government must intervene to push aggregate demand back out to full potential. That's what we discussed in the previous video. Um, so Demand side policy is focused on government intervening to influence aggregate demand to achieve these three objectives, price stability, full employment, economic growth. And we looked in the previous uh, video, uh, one side of demand side policies, which is fiscal policy, the role of the central government. But in this video, we're gonna introduce monetary policy and this will be further developed in later videos. But as an introduction, monetary policy is focused on the role of the central bank. And the central bank can control the supply of money that's in circulation within the money market. They can print money and expand it, or they contract, or they can contract the supply of money, but that's for another discussion. So we can divide monetary policy into two parts. One is expansionary monetary policy, where the central bank is increasing the supply of money, which leads to interest rates falling. And interest rates is a reflection of the value of money. How cheap is it to borrow money? So if we're increasing the supply of money, money is not scarce, so it's cheap to borrow, so the interest rates are low. Uh, opposite to that is contractionary monetary policy. Here, the central bank is contracting the supply of money. They are reducing its supply, so money becomes increasingly scarce, and thus its value rises, so interest rates go up. Okay. So let's look at, uh, at both expansion and contraction historically uh, in, an, in a historical example. Here we have the interest rates over time for the Federal Reserve Bank, which is the central bank in the United States. And we want to focus on what's happening between 2000 and 2005. Here we see that interest rates are about at, our, at or about uh, 6%, uh, which is reasonable. But then we see a dramatic fall in interest rates after 2001 or during 2001. This is a result of the September 11th terrorist attack. And that event led to a rapid fall in consumer and business confidence. There was fear that the US economy would fall into recession as a result of falling consumption and investment spending. So to fight that, the central bank applied expansionary monetary policy. Here they are printing money. Money is less scarce, so the interest rates fall below 2.5%, which is pretty much a historical low. You can see that it really never fell below 2.5% um, since you know back in the um, 50s and 60s. So that was a record low. Then we go into 2002, 2003, 2004, the US economy was approaching full potential uh, it was strong and there was no reason for the interest rates to be this low, but they were maintained low. So if interest rates were low, it was cheap to borrow money. People were borrowing that money and spending on what? They were buying homes, apartments, uh, old homes, brand new homes. And we see in this home price index, which is going over a century of home price data, that there's a sudden jump in the lead up to 2005. So people are borrowing that money and we're seeing increased consumption and investment spending as the economy booms with the housing bubble. And we see that right here. So to combat that inflationary gap, as we're about to illustrate, what should the central bank do? We see that they raise interest rates. So we're gonna focus on this period here in our graph how the central bank is starting to see an inflationary gap appear, and they respond by raising interest rates to slow down aggregate demand, okay? So here we have our chart. We have 81 equal to the Keynesian aggregate supply curve. AD1 is equal to the Keynesian uh, 
aggregate supply curve, which provides an equilibrium price level at PL2 and real GDP is at full potential. All right, we're at full employment, the economy is healthy, we're achieving a moderate level of economic growth, and the price level is rising, so we're getting a moderate level of inflation, perhaps 2% inflation. But because of the low interest rates, people are borrowing money and spending it on housing and on um, other goods and services. So we want to remember that AD equals C plus I plus G plus, we'll put in here, exports minus imports, all right? So we're going to remember that aggregate demand is equal to this. As people borrow and spend on housing, that's a component of investment spending. Investment spending is rising. And because the housing sector is doing well, people feel a change in wealth. They feel that their uh, the value of their properties are rising. That encourages to borrow and spend. So consumption spending is rising. And that takes AD outward. Aggregate demand is going to shift out into an inflationary gap. Okay, So let's just say it's going out to this point. 81 to AD2, and we're at point B. And we notice that real GDP is increasing just slightly, right, just slightly to this point. So we're entering a inflationary gap, Y inflation, with a price level that's exceedingly high, PL3. Okay, so we're at 82 equals the Keynesian aggregate supply curve. We have a price level, an equilibrium price level at PL3, and real GDP now has entered an inflationary gap. Real GDP is now equal to Y inflation. And at that point, unemployment is less than the natural uh, less than the natural rate. Right? Unemployment in the U.S. at that point is less than the natural rate of unemployment. And real GDP at that point is greater than full potential GDP. So the economy is beginning to overheat. We're getting more output, and we're having a sudden rise in the price level, as we saw with that home price index. So that's a clear signal to macroeconomists that we need some type of demand-side intervention. We need to find a way to reduce aggregate demand. So the central bank, in this case, is going to employ contractionary monetary policy. Right? They're going to contract the supply of money. And that's going to lead to interest rates rising. And as interest rates rise, it's going to be more difficult for households to borrow and spend on goods and services. So consumption spending will fall. It will make it more difficult for firms to borrow and invest. And it will make it difficult also for households to buy housing. So we would expect consumption and investment spending to fall. And thus, aggregate demand would shift back in from 82 to 81, back to full potential, uh, a little bit, a little bit greater increase in unemployment. So we were back at full employment, or a little bit uh, decrease in real GDP or output. But we're trying to get that price level back down to PL2. So that's the objective. Uh, we could also apply fiscal policy. The central government could increase income and corporate taxes. They can reduce government spending, and it would have the same effect. So let's just quickly analyze this as we would on a paper one exam. As can be seen, we have a Keynesian model illustrating the creation and elimination of an inflationary gap. We're measuring real GDP on the x-axis, price level on the y-axis. Keynesian aggregate supply curve has three sections, a horizontal section where we assume that labor contracts, minimum wage legislation, worker or union resistance to wage cuts, and even employer resistance to cutting wages sets a kind of price floor, as we see at PL1. Then we have section two, where the economy is approaching full potential GDP. 
and then we have section three where we uh, have fully employed all of our inputs and we can only get a fixed quantity of outputs and increased aggregate demand would only lead to a rising price level. Where 81 equals the Keynesian aggregate supply curve at point A, we have an equilibrium price level at PL2 and real GDP at YP or full potential GDP. We are at full employment and we have a moderate level of inflation. Then as a result of the central bank uh, in its expansion, applying expansionary monetary policy where they are increasing the supply of money and lowering interest rates at this point, interest rates are low, people begin to borrow money and spend on housing. Housing is a component of investment spending, so investment spending begins to rise uh, since people feel a change in wealth, since the value of their property has risen, consumption spending is increasing, and aggregate demand begins to shift out from 81 to 82. Where 82 equals Keynesian aggregate supply curve at point B, we have an equilibrium price level at PL3 and real GDP at Y inflation, where unemployment is less than the natural rate of unemployment and real GDP is greater than full potential GDP. So the economy is beginning to overheat. The central bank thus intervenes in, uh, in trying to reduce aggregate demand, and they do that through contractionary monetary policy. They will decrease the supply of money, which will lead to an increase in interest rates, making it more difficult for households and firms to borrow. And thus, we would expect reduced investment spending and consumption spending, causing 82 to shift into 81, so that the price level falls from PL3 back to PL2, and real GDP falls from Y inflation back to full potential GDP. Okay, so that would be an analysis. We've applied expansionary monetary policy as uh, causing 80 to shift out and contractionary monetary policy causing 82 to shift back in. And that's it. Thank you so much. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and if you have any questions, feel free to comment.